Please stand for our call to worship. Always a reminder of God's character, a reminder of the God that we come uh, to worship. Pastor Ray pointed out to me that the very last part of the very last of the last verse uh, is on our denomination's crest. Um, In your light do we see light. This is God's word from Psalm 36. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep man and beast you save, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. Let's praise the Lord as we sing the solid rock. Bow your head and pray uh, with me. God Almighty, as we gather uh, this day uh, to worship you, we do it because we have received uh, the greatest gift, none other than your Son, uh, Jesus Christ. He is our sure foundation, our solid rock, the one that we can stand on and depend upon. He is the head of your church, the one that we are called to follow and to serve. He is the basis of our unity. Father, we admit that we are are different from one another, but the commonality that we have in your Son, Jesus Christ, cuts across all of those differences. He is our help and our confidence, the one that we can run to when we're afraid. He is the perfect model and source of love. He is the one that your Word says constantly intercedes on our behalf before your throne of grace. He is the one through whom we receive all of our spiritual blessings. He is the second person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He died and rose again so that we could die to sin and be raised unto new life 
new life in Him, new life of fruitfulness for the sake of the gospel. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the leader of our lives and the forgiver of our sins. He is our all in all. He is our completer. By your grace, enable us to fix our eyes on Him, for He alone is the author and the perfecter of our faith. And now we, your covenant people, chosen to be yours before the foundation of the world, pray the prayer that Jesus taught his very first disciple, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, give us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And then this morning, our statement of faith, rather than being the Apostles' Creed, will be a question from the Heidelberg Catechism. The Heidelberg Catechism is what we're discussing on Sunday nights, uh, which we'll meet again uh, next week at 5 o'clock here in the sanctuary, so I encourage you to come and participate. So the question is this, 86, since we have been delivered from our misery by grace through Christ without any merit of our own, why then should we do good works? Because Christ, having redeemed us by His blood, is also restoring us by His Spirit into His image, so that with our whole lives we may show that we are thankful to God for His benefits, so that He may be praised through us, that we may be assured of our faith by its fruits, and so that by our living, our neighbors may won over to Christ. Amen. Please be seated.
This is God's Word from uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, has to do with the parable of the rich fool. And Jesus says in verse 15, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Uh, pray with me. Father, forgive us when we want what we do not have. By your grace, give us a, a contentment for what we do have and help us to really believe that you provide all of our needs. And convince us anew as we give our tithes and offerings above and beyond that, Father, that our, our life is not in our stuff, but our life is in you and your Son and the Holy Spirit and the gospel. And Father, that that life impacts all of life, not just certain parts of our life. Father, help us to live in a way that points others to you and to that life. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. that confidence and assurance that we come to read God's Word, that we receive His promises as sure as faithful, and we receive them confident that He will do all that He says. Pray with me. Lord, we thank You for Your Word, and thank You for this Sermon on the Mount, and as we come to the conclusion of that today, we pray that You would help us to put it all together and indeed, by your grace and the help of your Holy Spirit, to enfold it into our life. 
to live by your word gladly, hopefully, trustingly. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. The word of God. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell. And great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Amen. A fur-bearing trout. Have you ever seen such? I did. Up close. In person. This far away. I looked right at it at a museum in Orlando. Ripley's Believe It or Not. (laughs) Do you believe it? You're seeing it with your very eyes. What do you mean you don't believe it? Come on. Well, there were people in Europe and Great Britain who heard about these, and they ordered them, mounted for their collection, and they got them. But they are a hoax. Some skillful taxidermist took a trout and a rabbit and put the fur on it, and it looked pretty official, except that that can't happen. Truth matters. Truth matters. Far Side cartoon years ago um, showed some wolves standing there in gorilla suits looking at a flock of sheep. One of them has his head off, and he goes, wait a minute. Let's ditch the gorilla suits and get sheep's suits. You're not going to sneak up on sheep in a gorilla suit. So the disguise has to fit. Jesus here in the end of chapter 7 is summing up what he's been teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Last week we heard that we are to enter the narrow gate and follow the narrow road. We remember Matthew's first hearers were being persecuted by the majority. Uh, those who were on the, had gone through the wide gate, they were on the broad path, and the majority was saying, hey, we're the majority. You need to conform to our view. What a great word for his people then or now or any time to become all the more focused on Jesus and his word and to follow him. Part of, part of keeping to the narrow road means that we keep an eye out for false prophets. 
because they have the appearance of sheep outwardly, but inwardly, Jesus says, they're ferocious wolves. They're ravenous wolves. And he says the secret to keep in mind is their fruit. Good trees cannot bear bad fruit, nor bad trees produce good fruit. As we keep our feet on the narrow path, we have to understand that it is not the outward appearances that matter, it's the fruit produced. And so in telling us to beware of false prophets, Jesus makes abundantly clear that there is such a th thing as objective standard truth from which the falsehood of false prophets is to be distinguished. This was not a new thing that Jesus was saying. The prophet Jeremiah makes this contrast early in the 6th century before Christ. False prophets, he says, uh, ver, uh, chapter 23, uh, beginning at verse 16, speak visions of their own minds, while true prophets stand in the counsel of the Lord, hear His word, proclaim it to the people, and speak from the mouth of the Lord. So Jeremiah 23, 28 says, let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream. But let him who has my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat? He says there are two different things. We need to discern that. Jesus holds that truth and falsehood are not, they are not complementary insights into the same truth. They're mutually exclusive. And that those who propagate lies in the name of God are false prophets. And Jesus yells, beware! Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 23, 16, they are filling you with vain hopes. It sounds good. Fur-bearing trout sound really cool. The problem is they're not real. It's not true. False prophets are adept at blurring the issue of salvation. How important is that? Well, it's the road to life or the road to destruction. Jesus has just told us this in the sermon. Some would say, well, the narrow way is actually much broader than Jesus implied. It really requires very little change in belief or, or, or change in lifestyle. He just called it the narrow way, but it's actually very, very broad. Some dare to contradict Jesus and declare the, that the wide path does not actually lead to destruction. It's just another way to life. And Jesus says they're like ravenous wolves. Truth matters. If you're called to the witness stand in a court of law, what do they ask you? Will you tell us a good story? Make it up as you go. We'll believe anything you say. Apparently that's the case, but the, the requirement is that you swear to tell the truth. And if people have a fear of God... They will. When you don't, well, you just tell my truth. Truth matters. Jesus anticipates the day when there will be men and women who call him Lord, who even perform uh, miracles in his name, and they will be revealed as false prophets, as those who have hidden themselves in sheep's clothing. And then these terrifying words. I mean, when we, when we die, what are the words that we hope to hear when we get to heaven? It's not spell Czechoslovakia, right? What is the word that we hope to hear? Well done, good and faithful servant. Now, not all that get to heaven will hear that. I, I don't think that that's just the standard greeting Paul says some will get there and it'll be like there's the smell of smoke on their clothing. They just made it. But they did make it by the grace of God through Christ. They did make it. 
But some will hear, well done, but what terrifying, what a terrifying thought to hear, I never knew you, depart from me. Hear that judgment by Jesus. He can and he will judge. He has that authority and he will do so impartially and perfectly. Now, this is not people who were saved and became lost again. Whatever their words and actions may have been, Jesus says, I never knew you. Jesus, in Scripture, we see him as our prophet and our priest and our king. Here he's speaking prophetically. Uh, our Westminster Confession, uh, our, our Catechism, question 24, says that Jesus is our prophet in revealing to us by his word and spirit the will of God for our salvation. How do we recognize false prophets today? How, what do we look for? What do we listen for? Let me give you some things that I would suggest Jesus says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. He said that earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 6, verses 19 to 21. If a preacher is emphasizing gaining wealth and storing it up in bigger and bigger barns here on this earth, that's not the gospel message. That is not it. Jesus is not against productivity and gaining wealth and working hard. All that's encouraged. But if that's, if the message, hear this, if the message is Jesus died on the cross so that your bank accounts and cars would be bigger than everyone else's, that's not the gospel. False prophets refuse to call out sin which ignores our need for a Savior. Jesus is your Savior. From what? Well, from nothing, really. Isn't that compelling? They refuse to call out sin. They reject Jesus in that manner. I would submit they they teach there is no hell. There's nothing to worry about. So there's no need for true repentance because repent means to turn away from one path and one direction and to follow Jesus on the narrow path that leads to life. The apostles taught Acts 4.12, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. But false prophets reject Jesus as the only way. There are many ways. Just choose one. Romans 10, 17 says, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But false prophets reject the authority and the integrity and the infallibility of Scripture and cause confusion. They may look and sound like one of God's people, but as the wolf wants to devour the sheep, they want to devour your soul. Where do we find them? Well, they're kind of everywhere. Find them in colleges and in seminaries and pulpits. You can find them in news shows and politicians and people in power whose um, primary agenda is protect and ensure their ongoing power. People who really believe that truth matters want answers, want answers to things. And we don't expect that there would be double standards applied because truth matters. And we also believe, we really do believe in the doctrine of human depravity. So we know that all people are capable of duplicity. We have to be discerning. We have to make judgments about what we hear. And judgments will be made. Where are we supposed to start in making judgments? Jesus has already told us that, right? 
the log in our own eye. We start with ourselves, and then we use the same standard, not a different standard for everyone else, the same standard. How much do you hear that being said? Well, wait a minute, before we go attacking that one, we better examine ourselves first. They would be yanked. We can't have you saying things like that. Jesus' warning to his people is real. It's urgent. Beware of false prophets. They're speaking for and guiding us to the wide gate that leads to destruction. Beware of them. Some of them are just scammers. They are charlatans. They know their faults. They're practicing deception for personal gain. But many false prophets have convinced themselves that they're speaking truth. They are the blind leading the blind if we follow them, if we listen to them, if we trust them. Jesus says, don't do that. Beware. Which means we're to test the prophets. Well, how? Again, it's not a new thing. The prophet Isaiah was aware of um, people. They were facing an Assyrian invasion. uh, But there were prophets saying, don't worry. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. And Isaiah says, Isaiah 8.20, to the teaching and to the testimony. What a great word. To the teaching and to the testimony. To the teaching and to the testimony. If they will not speak according to this word, it's because they have no dawn. They have no light. Or 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Two words sum all this up. Truth matters. Truth matters. Jesus says you will recognize them by their fruits. Verse 16, in our area, we've witnessed this very thing in the citrus industry as they have been battling greening for years. Thousands of acres of groves have been dug up and burned. Others simply left dying where they were. The deceased tree bears bad fruit. Verse 17. I just say here, please pray. There is some replanting going on. Perhaps you've seen some of that. There's a product that is giving hope that the industry can be revitalized. Please pray for those in the citrus industry and for our farming. And and may we be as attentive and resolute as our citrus farmers in recognizing false prophets and rooting them out, calling them out. Certainly don't listen to them and don't follow them. Moses wrote in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 22, And if you say in your heart, well, how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? How can we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? He says, if a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. And don't listen to him. The sky is falling. Oh, not yet. The sky is falling. Oh, not yet. The sky is falling. Oh, not yet. When do we stop listening to him? Charles Spurgeon says, we must be careful not only about our way, but about our leaders. They come to us. They come as prophets. They come with every outward commendation, but they are very Balaam's. Numbers 22 through 24, you can look that up later, but it wasn't a compliment. And will surely curse those who they pretend to bless. In our nation, there is concern. A song came out, not my genre of music, but it has hit the top of the charts. It's cross ethnicities in agreement. Rich men north of Richmond. One line is, they think you don't know, but I know that you do. 
what's amazing to me about the song is the outrage it sparked. Because I've heard a lot worse songs. But who is the out, who's outraged? It's rich people north of Richmond. It's those who prop them up. I mean, listen to the people. Look at them. They are not the blue-collar workers, the everyday folks that are having a hard time in our country now. They're not the ones complaining about this song. Again, what's going on? What, are we hearing why it's crossing so many people and, and touching them? I mean, people weeping, hearing the song. It's true. We can recognize a tree by its fruit. Everyday folk may not recognize it by its leaves or by its trunk, but we can recognize a fruit. I mean, I, I can tell an orange from a pear from an apple. Citrus folks can tell you if it's a navel, a navelina, a valentia, a hamlin, a mandarin, a belladonna, a homosassa, a parson brown, a tangerine, a tangelo. They'll, they'll tell you what kind it is. I just know it's an orange. It's very practical knowledge. And what is the fruit of false prophets? What is the fruit of false prophets? That's what we can look at. We can't just know a person's heart. But we can see their fruit. Is what they're producing fear, worry, judgmentalism? That is judging some by one standard and others by another standard? And and, and, uh, does it produce greed or pride or superiority or wickedness or flagrant sin or heresy or doubts about God's Word? That's the fruit we would look for. If that's what it's producing, it would indicate this is a false prophet. What's the fruit of a true prophet of God? We don't have to guess. Galatians 5.20 is a good starting place. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, love for God's Word, repentance, prayerfulness, compassion for those stuck in their sin, not just judging, the glory of God and truth. Truth matters. Again, quoting Spurgeon, our king is a great teacher of prudence that is of living with discernment. We are not to judge, but we are to know. And the rule for this knowledge is as simple as it is safe. You will know them by their fruit. Jesus is saying that not only will his people not bear bad fruit, and hear this, this doesn't mean that his people will never sin, The word is very clear that we will, but we will bear the fruit of repentance. That's good fruit. Jesus doesn't teach that we'll all bear the same amount of fruit. In fact, he teaches just the opposite. When we get to Matthew 13, verse 23, he's telling a story. He says, some will bear 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. And there's no condemnation in any of those. But if there's no fruit in our life, no fruit, then that's a problem. So are we supposed to go and chop down and burn down bad trees? Nope, that's not what he says here. But he says we're to know. The Lord is protecting us from coming under the influence of false prophets. Again, we start with ourselves, the log in our own eye. But then we make discernment and we avoid false prophets. God's truth builds up. It builds up His church. Devilish error is destructive. It tears down His church. And if we care about truth, if we care about God's church, then we have to take Jesus seriously about this warning. Indeed, I would submit that if the church of Jesus Christ had consistently and diligently taken seriously this warning of Jesus, then the church of Jesus Christ would not be in the state of theological and moral confusion in which we find ourselves today. 
He told us what we need to do. Do we believe Him? And so the emphasis here is truth matters. And Jesus shifts then from disguised wolves to foolish builders, and it's kind of the final warning here to those who have been listening to Jesus teach, but not embracing what He teaches, (laughs) not taking Jesus to heart. Jesus cares about how we respond to His instruction. Verbal profession is part of it. We confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord. Uh, And intellectual knowledge is a part of it. We believe in our hearts that God raised Him from the dead. But that alone is not enough. Neither can substitute for obedience. We are called to obedience to the Lord. The contrast between right and wrong responses to Jesus' teaching shows us that neutrality is, is not possible. We can't be Sweden in this, okay? We're just neutral, neutral, not taking any sides. Jesus calls us to take his side, to take his side. More than what we say about Jesus in his teaching, we're learning to practice obedience to his teaching. Everyone who then hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock, verse 24. And what happens to the house on the sand? Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them, well, it's a solemn word. It fell. It fell. And great was the fall of it. Hearing but not doing what Jesus, what the Scriptures teach it's inevitable that the fall comes. It's not a, it, it, it's, it, it's, it, it's a when question, W-H-E-N, not an if question. So there's two paths, wide and narrow, to good or, or, or bad fruit, to wise or foolish builders, and all of that, Jesus is saying truth matters. And this is how he concludes the Sermon on the Mount. This is how he concludes the ethics of the kingdom of God. Or as we called it it, when we started uh, at the beginning of the summer in in the Beatitudes, chapter 5, the Jesus life, living a Jesus-concentric life, Jesus at the center of our life as Lord and Savior, based on the truth that Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. What did the crowds think about this? Well, they were astonished at his teaching, it says. They were astonished. He taught with authority. They were astonished, but apparently for many, that was all they were, was astonished. Whew, he's a powerful preacher. Did it make any difference? No, but he was a powerful preacher. There was one well-known, openly agnostic uh, leader in our nation who would go hear George Whitfield preach. And they asked him, "Why, why do you go hear him? You don't believe that. He goes, but he does. He would go hear him preach because he preached with conviction and power. I don't know if he ever came to saving faith, but he was going to the place to hear about it. There was something drawing him, perhaps the Holy Spirit, to hear. To remain unresponsive to Jesus' teaching is to be in grave danger. Grave danger. To put ourselves in the place of judge over the teachings of Jesus and saying, no, I think he's got that one wrong. Listen to me on this. It's grave danger indeed. Jesus didn't teach like their scribes. He taught with authority because he had all authority. He has all authority in heaven and earth to this day. So what are the true followers of Jesus then and now? 
What is our characteristics? Well, from the Sermon on the Mount, we see that we are not to judge with a double standard. We are to be discerning, but we don't judge with a double standard, and we do that in a world that is founded on judging by a double standard. We take the narrow road. We pray. We're people who pray, and we continue to pray, and we pray um, with a childlike confidence and humble simplicity, trusting the nature of our Heavenly Father. We pray, and we don't stop. We follow the narrow path of the minority, not the loudest, not the trendiest, not the easiest. And ultimately, Jesus' words, hearing them and doing them, that's the foundation of our life. There's big choices we make in life. Many of you have made them and lived them out. There's the choice of our vocation. That's a big choice that we make. We're going to do that a long time. There's the choice of, uh, of a life partner. That's a big choice. You're going to live with that person a long time. But more momentous than either of those is the choice of life itself. Which road are we going to travel? Which foundation are we going to build upon? Truth matters. And if you think that's overstated, I have a fur-bearing trout that I'd like to sell you. They're rare and precious, and you will be the only one on your block to have one. Talk to me. Lord, we thank you for truth. We thank you that truth matters. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you that you've called us to build our life, to find our life, to rejoice in life, in Christ alone. Amen. Stand together as we sing.
great singing, great truth. We stand in the power of Christ and Christ alone. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ who holds you, the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest with you and abide with you, strengthening you always and giving you confidence for the narrow way, the way of life. Amen.